that listening and, and the rhyme development. Um, Dr. Seuss books are great like that. There's lots of good books like that, of, of predictable books and rhyming books um, that can be broken down and, and really work in each of, of the areas of, of the five areas of that you need to really uh, development of reading. There's some writing materials over there. There's some really cool, Crayola in particular makes some really cool writing things. They have, um, our OT would be very happy to see triangular crayons over there, which she feels are really developmentally appropriate to help them start those uh, grip. There's, they make lots of cool um, markers and, and other crayons. And it, it's, it's an area that the boys tend to be less, more reluctant to use, but I bet there's something out there that you can hook them into, whether there's a little, again, the dollar store, a little blackboard that they can write on. Um, and what else do I have over there? Um, matching, there's, there's a letter matching. You know, you can start with color matching, shape matching, letter matching, again, dollar store that um, I, I would encourage engaging with your child in those activities, you know, using words, it's not, um, you know, a direct instruction, it's engaging, it's stimulating, and helping them build those associations um, in a play format that, you know, going back to how a young child work, how a young child learns, which is through interactive multi-sensory material. So um, I tried to get a little bit of those. Thing one and thing two are always exciting to have hanging around. Um, what else is over there? I, I think that's kind of the range and, and feel free to explore them um, of the areas. But um, so again, as I was um, looking at in my, in my studies of the research of, of trying to kind of get up the snuff with, all right, so how does the early child impact um, the reading at the Warren School in the K-1-2 grades and, and the preschool now? What, what can we really look at? And I, I think as parents, um, you're the ones that really will make a big impact to um, develop these skills. You have them for most of the days and trying to make you know, handouts that shows you easy ways to embed it throughout the day. You know, you, you don't have to buy anything special or have any um, direct instruction materials, but in a, in a fun, natural way, but in, embedding. And, and the two th kind of themes that I felt were most important, as, as has been said, is the vocabulary development and reading to your child are the two things that, that I think are really most important. And my personal favorite, though, is, is going on the field trips of experiencing things out in the real world as much as possible, building vocabulary that way in a fun, high interest way um, that both provides a fun, engaging opportunity with you and your child, but also um, provides that, that foundation um, in so many areas. Can I say one thing? Sure. Oh, great, great, great. So first of all, I, I didn't say this earlier, and it's so important that we really as a state consider you to be your child's first teacher. And you're really the teacher if you do it right from prenatal through kindergarten or third grade, you'll do it right um, through 12th grade. Um, but in this state, we're really focused on science, technology, engineering, and math, and really trying to give those opportunities. Well, in the early years between birth or prenatally through third grade, that's often about oral language. So you heard examples of counting the legs on the ladybug. You hear me talking about questioning and inquiry, which are really basic science skills. And so math, while we're not talking about math, children can actually add a large number, maybe a little less than 10, up in their head. And then when you want them to count higher than that, and they do it, you say, well, how did you do that? And that creates the exchange. What's important is going back and forward. And I know many of you at home or here are panicked, like, oh, Oh my God, he's five years old and I haven't done all of this and how am I going to get caught up? Um, children are ready and open for us to provide them these opportunities. We really want them to have about 5,000 words they can use really well by the time they get to five, which means they have to be exposed to about 30,000 words. So we do need to get busy reading and taking them out um, on experiences, um, but it's never too late and you are the one that can make that difference in their lives and you should hold their grandparents and sisters and brothers and uncles accountable for this work as well. Okay, um, I would just add piggybacking off both of these that this the experiences really do offer um, 
the background knowledge, right? So the vocabulary development and the background knowledge for children to really have will help them access more books and more types of um, text, which is just going to allow them to be a more flexible reader and really be able to touch base um, with all types of books um, and not just fiction and not just narrative, but all different types of um, nonfiction texts. And that comes through the experiences at a very young age and talking and using that vocabulary. So um, I feel just, again, the research it does highlight that the vocabulary and the background knowledge are the key predictors for how a child's going to continue to do on that um, trajectory. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. What I just want to do is just touch on something that Kelly had actually talked about before in the work that her organization had done on the um, early liter the, um, the act relative to third grade reading proficiency. Um, that was an act, as she said, that was signed into law by the governor um, this September that, that had been worked on for quite a while. And what it does is, is to, to create a panel to figure out how do we get all our kids reading in the third grade. Um, one of the experiences that, that some folks have, or lots of folks have, is that third grade is that magic time. All kids can go through the system, but third grade is the time when some of them really start to struggle. And they start to struggle because they're not able to read. That's the sort of shift in time for students when before that they're learning how to read. At third grade, all of a sudden, they're expected to read and get some information out of it. Um, for those folks involved with special education, that's where probably the biggest number of referrals for special education comes from, is that third grade. Everything seems to be going reasonably fine, but at third grade, we, that's the breaking point. So what we did as a commonwealth together, like um, Dr. Killen said, we all work together to say we need to address that. And that's what this bill that the governor signed into law does. And it also allows us to capture federal money. But it gets us all working together and to figure out what is the strategy for Massachusetts for us to all move forward to do that. One of the things that, that is unique in Massachusetts in lots of ways is one, and Dr. Killens touched on it as well, is we have this sort of innovative economy that's here. We have, you know, the largest number of universities probably anywhere on the planet is here in Massachusetts and in this sort of eastern section of Massachusetts as well. Um, and we also, many of you probably don't know, that our students in Massachusetts take this test that's used on a national standard, which I can't think the name of it. NAEP, that, that Massachusetts students scored the highest, if not the highest, at least in the top four in the world. So our students are coming out at the very top in the world from Massachusetts. But that's not enough for us. We need everybody to succeed. One of the challenges that was raised by a few of the panelists was the issue with socioeconomic issues um, and that there's disparities that we need to address. So those are some of the things they're working on uh, and some of the things that we're all working on together and trying to find solutions for. Um, I think what we want to do is just spend, give the audience a chance to ask some questions and maybe have some more interaction among the panelists. Um, and I know a few of you are sitting out there with burning questions. So um, does anybody have a question? Yes. Right. So, so the question was, what do, I, what do we think about technology? What's the role of PBS and public television and iPads and other technologies that support children to read? Uh, they're fine, but they only introduce the concept. Children actually learn in the relationship. At zero to three, television is not an option. There's no benefit, really, of children zero to maybe two and a half sitting in front of the television. And even then, we want them to have small segments. But then an adult's got to be there with 
them so you can extend what they saw on television. A lot of the public television shows now start out, um, and I wish I could remember some of the names, with an activity, or, uh, something that happens, and then it has an activity and it says, okay, you try to go do that at home, but of course children need adults to be able to do that. So all of those things can give you access. I was thinking as I was reading a book, well, what if a parent didn't know the word chameleon? Then use your iPad and figure out chameleon and figure it out with them together. We don't seem to use dictionaries anymore. We can hit our iPhone and figure it out. And you're sharing that experience of discovery. But the technology and the television only opens the door and is only done well with an adult. It is not done alone because children don't learn in that stale face of a television. They learn through the interaction um, and the extension of the learning that they get in relationship with adults. And I would just add, I think that um, because that background knowledge component is so critical to build from birth until beyond um, so that they can access any type of information that they're reading or looking at, any type of technology, is, uh, it does really support that, right? So if you're watching, you know, a lot of children might not ever grow up around a chameleon. So if they're watching something, it gives them a lot of that background so that when they encounter text on chameleons or see the picture of that, it allows them to say, oh, I've seen that before. But again, it's only as good as the interaction, the questions that you're having back and forth with them as they're watching it. The, almost the same thing that you do with them while you read a book, right? So engaging them, oh, this reminds me of, or oh, um, what do you think of that? Like, where, where might you seen this? Or have you seen this? Or So again, I think it's really powerful in the background knowledge component and as long as you interact with it. I debated bringing a list of appropriate apps for <laughs> preschoolers um, because I, I think it can be another tool, um, not a primary one, but just something that can be used to supplement um, what what you do with your child you know there's some really cool writing ones on there you know if if a child needs a little extra high interest activity it, it's worked wonders um, it, it is a multi-sensory tool but it is again very passive learning it, it's it's without the uh, adult interaction so there is I think some worthy apps on there um, I am kind of an app geek and I, I do, but I think you have to tread carefully. You know, if, if it's that time of day that, or that you just need to get things done, we all have those times of day where you just give up that iPhone and, and for the peace and quiet. Um, but I, I think it is, it, you know, it's it just a, a, a tool can be used in, in moderation. Um. Yes. The question is, what recommendation do we have for bilingual children, children who don't speak English at home? Um, first of all, we want to be very clear that from birth to five, maintaining the home language is critical. We want parents to talk to children in the language where they can give them the most meaning. And one of the troublesome things we can do is to take a parent whose primary language is Portuguese or Spanish and only has 5,000 words themselves and have them try to constantly talk to their child in that language. Language. They won't be able to make the story come alive. They won't be able to give the full experience. Um, having said that, over time, children need consistent exposure to English in order to grow and learn. And we find that if they're literate in their home language, we can transfer them um, to the English language, but it takes consistent opportunity. And for parents who are bilingual, um, both Spanish and English or Portuguese and English, it's important to maintain that home language and do it in consistent way. So maybe dinner time we only speak Portuguese or bath time we only speak Spanish and at other times you might choose to speak English. But home language, we live in a, in a global economy and these children are really at an advantage if we can build off that home language. Often when they get to kindergarten they've got a much broader vocabulary. Now that doesn't mean we know how to assess that. That doesn't mean we know how to engage. And then again you as a parent have to come to us and talk to us about the kinds of languages your child has been 
around and about what they know as we support them to translate into English. And I'd encourage you to take them to museums and libraries regularly where they're speaking English or they have an opportunity to go to story time um, and they will grow. Uh, the other thing is if you are a, a non-English speaker, to read the story in your native language first. In fact, the book I was reading to you today is actually in Spanish and English. Read it in your own language first so they enjoy the story and they're excited and they like to hear it four or five times and then read it in English because then you can focus on teaching them the vocabulary and the words. Yeah, and to piggyback that, the, what the research shows is that uh, the, the bilingual, the um, when you look at the trajectory for children at the monolingual and the bilingual, they will progress at the same rate on the code-based skills. So a lot of that print reading or, you know, really just cracking the decoding. Um, but what happens is the word gap really um, becomes highlighted because of the background that piece that I've been talking about, the background knowledge. So it, they don't necessarily have the interpreting or the synthesizing or the connecting skills that really make you make sense of the text. So that is the type of work that you can really promote with your own, the, the, the um, native na language. So that conversation of reading in your home language, building that background, getting them to think using interpretation, synthesis, summarizing, just helps them continue to develop on that rate because the language piece will, will click a lot quicker. <laughs> yes. How do you get a child to be interested in uh, reading? Because uh, I, I have a boy that I think we need everything right. <laughs> So the question is, you know, how do you deal with the child? I'm sure you did everything right. You read to him, you raised him, um, you exposed him to books, you got lots of books probably at home and lots of opportunity. <laughs> Some of them never read and still in the package. You know, the important thing is what is he interested in? It, what's he interested in? No. What does he watch on television? What does he want to see on television? SpongeBob. But what kind of content? Does he like the zoo? Does he like flowers? Does he like building things? Does he like sports? He likes Legos. So, so I would encourage you to go get a book that actually may be ab above his le literacy level a little, but that is about building and architecture and how architects put things together. Um, we often find that we can get those children interested in reading, but they're not going to read the basal text or the thing that you bought home that you thought was a good book because it's on the, the, Calicot, the Calicot list of books that should be read. He's only going to read it if it's something that he's interested in and he wants to explore. I bet if you got him a Lego set and you made him read the manual because it had a motor in it and in order to put it together he had to read that manual he would do that fine because he probably has the skills knowledge and ability but he doesn't have the interest in what you're encouraging him to read so I dig deeper about what he's what he's interested in and what he wants to read and then I manuals are fine reading manuals is reading and so I think a lot of times we get stuck on you got to go through this book or you got to go through this book and if they're interested in building things and getting them a set and having them read that is also supportive of their literacy development. You know, all these other books are much more interesting for me, or just Wind in the Willows. Like, come on, let me read this book to you. No, 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 no interest in doing that. But, you know, they have SpongeBob books. They yeah. have, yeah. you know, early right. phonic right. 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 SpongeBob right. books. They have early phonic Lego right. books. Right. So right. I just broke down, and I just, and eventually right. they moved past right. that. And by giving him sort of something that he wanted to read, you know, I had to, you know, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Mm -hmm. and I had to <laughs> my husband. <laughs> But, you know, at least it was getting yeah. him excited right. about reading and he right. was doing it, um, even though it wasn't my preference. Um, 
Well, and the other thing is the book that you want to read, read it to him. Sit next to him. Let him sit on your lap. Pick a chapter book, The Diary of a Wimpy Kid, or any of the other books that may be above his level. You read it. Because you also want him to have the content. You want him to have the relationship. And when you get to chapter three and you say, okay, it's time to go to bed, and he wants to hear what's in chapter four, he's going to have a light under his cover trying to figure it out. So you also shouldn't take the the literature that you want him to be exposed to and say, well, he's not going to read it, I'm not going to bother. You should use that as a way to read to him while he's in the tub, read to him, we can't read while you drive, but you know, read to him if you're the passenger in the car and you don't get car sick as I do, um, to, to create interest and activity, because he'll pick up chapter five because he's going to want to know what happened to that character. to be ready for children. And children come in all shapes with different birthdays at different times of the year and it makes it very challenging for you as a preschool teacher or a kindergarten teacher, but that's in part the job. So we want parents to know that when they're age appropriate, when they reach the age, and in Massachusetts it's different depending on what town you're in, um, they are in fact ready for school. I think if we're talking to parents about what they need to do to get them ready, everything that we've talked about tonight is important. Um, having them go to play groups if you choose to keep your children at home so that they're exposed that a lot of what children need in that transition is the social skills you know if you were the prince or the princess for your first five years of life and you show up and there's 28 other princes and princesses that could be very difficult and so parents finding an opportunity for social groups either with their friends or their peers or in libraries or other places um, social skills um, are important and then everything we've talked about tonight I, I resist saying that there's a list of what children are to be ready. Um, their children develop at different rates. Their learning is really integrated, whether it's physical development. You know, part of what was discussed earlier was fine motor skills. You need those in order to go to kindergarten. And there's lots of things that we want children to be able to do, but they get it through experience and exposure. And there isn't a neat package definition. What we want children to do is to be excited and interested in learning. We want them to be able to get along with others and be able to come into the building and be curious and interested and engaged. And we can't ask them to sit in chairs in those first couple of years. They have to have stations because they continue to learn in those dramatic play areas, in the library area, in the block area. They learn from themselves, from their peers, and, and from their instructors. So we really in Massachusetts don't have a definition of kindergarten readiness per se other than the date, but we are supporting parents to understand growth in in the physical area, in the fine motor area, in the literacy area as we're talking to you now and want you to expose your children to as many experiences as possible without exhausting them, right? Because you don't want karate and soccer and basketball all in the same day. So you have to do it in a way that maintains the child's interest and keeps them gaining the background knowledge we've been talking about. Adults too to say you know what's going to allow them to be really ready is the collaboration between the pre-k and the kindergarten right and and really ensuring that whatever uh, the children have experienced in pre-k has been transferred or translated or you know given to the kindergarten teacher so that we have an eye on where these children are along that trajectory right because the last thing that we want to do is not intervene to support them in a, in a you know targeted way to allow them to be on that path so I think in some ways it's a responsibility you know we have so many responsibilities as teachers yet I think to really ensure that readiness um, the collaboration which across to help. Thank you. See if we can get this fixed here. Um, if I may, I would like to speak to that a little bit more too. 
um, seeing as we do work very closely in this community with the kindergarten um, and that is one of the, the roles that we do play and that is to collaborate with those kindergarten um, administrators and we you know find out what is it that you want your children to be able to do when they walk in those doors in September and um, and surprisingly enough, it's not just the cognitive ability. They really are looking for your students to be really self-assured. They're looking for them to be independent and be able to take care of themselves, take care of their own personal care items that they have. They're looking for someone who is eager to learn, who's, who's had an exposure to different kinds of things, um, who's not afraid to try new things, who is excited about learning. And those are um, some of the things that they really look for. Um, the cognitive ability we know is there and it always will be be there, but it's just um, getting them ready. Um, we really are um, kind of like Bob the Builders. It's, it's getting them ready to to be um, taking the next step in terms of what that looks like. A lot of what we do in pre-K, believe it or not, is we practice a lot, and it's not practice for the for the purpose of. Perf perfection, it's practice for the um, purpose of mastery. Um, we'll come up with different activities to show them or um, expose, give them exposure to the alphabet, but we may have 20 different activities and we continually put them out. Um, sometimes, you know, I hear teachers, they get a little frustrated. Gee, I spent all this time, I made this game, it looks great, I put it out, and they weren't interested in it. You put it away, you bring it out a couple of months later, and they make a connection because the game may have something to do with something that happened outside in the playground, or it may have something to do with a topic you're talking about in the classroom, and then now all of a sudden there is that connection that's made. But we do a lot of practicing over and over again. I mean, when you think of yourself as an adult, you know, when you're learning a new skill, you need that time. You know, you can do it once or twice, but do you really know how to? How do you master that skill if you don't keep practicing it? So that's really a lot of what we do. Um, I think we sometimes forget that um, you know uh, children need that reinforcement, and and that's really what we need to do, as well as being role models. I think that's another uh, big thing that they they look to us for. They're like sponges, and whatever we we say to them, and, and I think that's one of the things about this age that I love the most is. Um, their innocence and the fact that no matter what you say, you could sing off tune and it doesn't matter to them. They still think you're the best singer in the world. Um, but you're right. You need to have a really strong connection with whatever district that you're working in within. Um, there's a, as um, Dr. Killens has mentioned, we have a mixed delivery system of preschools out there. There's a lot of wonderful programs in the community in this area. We're very, very fortunate. And what that means, though, is that in order to really put our best foot forward, we really do have to have that collaborative piece. So I think that's that connection. You know, get to know the kindergarten teachers in your town or your community. Get to know and meet them. What do they want? What do they expect? What's the best thing that you can do to prepare your children? And I can't leave this question without reinforcing make the parent your partner. Um, because often what you see in the first weeks of school or in the first year of school can be reinforced or turned apart by what parents do. And so parents are really our partners. They are their children's first teacher. So as you build a skill, you want to support and have that skill supported at home. And so really looking um, that the partnership with the district is critical and understanding that piece. But the day that child comes to you, partnering up with that parent in the good times so that when the child is struggling or you want to push them to a new level or give them a new skill, you've got that partnership with the parent that will help take it to that level. Any other questions? And let me just tell a funny okay. story. I'm sorry. I'll just tell you a funny story about the parent thing. So this is a, a funny story that I heard. Um, there was a kid, and she was in the second grade, and she came to school and she said, my mom says I don't have to do that homework. And um, the child came to school the next day and said, my mom said I don't have to do that homework. So the principal said, well, how could that be? How could the kid be in the second grade and the mom saying you don't have to do that homework? So he called the mother in, and he said, um, 
did you tell her that she didn't have to do her homework? And she said, yes, I told her she didn't have to do the homework. She doesn't have to do the homework because all you're trying to do is prove that I'm not smart. And I'm not going to sit there every night and try to pretend I know what you're asking her to do. And so rather than go through that, if you want that homework done, you do it with her during the school day. So also don't take the children's first response and the impact of us asking children to do things at home and what they bring back without really understanding what's going on in the story. Because for that mom who may be bilingual, who may speak another language, who may not be good in math, the struggle of doing the homework was more of a challenge and then created these behavioral challenges um, for the teacher in the classroom. So parents are really our partners, but we have to understand where they're starting as well. Any other questions? I want to thank you folks for coming tonight. Um, and I want to thank uh, Pat White, the director of the Pittaway School, for hosting us here um, and for her um, service to the town of Ashland. Um, also, I want to thank Dr. Killens, who is the Commissioner of Early Education and Care for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and Kelly Kurzwer, Director of Reading Proficiency at, at Strategies for Children, and also Betsy Salamon, who is the Early Childhood Coordinator for Ashland Public Schools. And uh, I'm Tom Sinicandro, the State Representative for Ashland and Framingham, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.